We respectfully acknowledge the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which Swinburne's Australian campuses are located in Melbourne's east and outer east, and pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. We also acknowledge and respect the traditional owners of lands across Australia, their elders, ancestors, cultures and heritage, and recognise the continuing sovereignties of all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nations. Virtual heritage traditionally recreates tangible cultural heritage in the form of physical buildings and objects. Intangible cultural heritage has largely been ignored by museums until relatively recently, compared to their protections of tangible heritage. With UNESCO adopting the Convention for the Safeguarding of Intangible Cultural Heritage in 2003. This is largely because of the general Western cultural obsession with things, defining cultural heritage primarily as places and objects where material is elevated above the immaterial. Early virtual heritage echoed this imbalance of cultural heritage priorities. Partly this is due to a limitation of the digital 3D medium itself. Virtual environments are suited to a reduction of objects and buildings to Cartesian coordinates and digitally mapped geometry. This 3D geometry can be used far more easily to recreate a static model like a building or an object than to create an animated human going about the activities of daily life. To create these replicas of tangible heritage, virtual heritage experts draw on other static material from our thing-focused cultural approach. This includes archival sketches, floor plans, photographs, and where possible, scans of the buildings themselves. Documentary evidence of the physicality of the site or object with little view to how to convey immaterial aspects of its use. Ironically, while intangible cultural heritage was largely ignored, it is this intangible cultural heritage that gives cultural meaning to the site or object, elevating it to the importance that make the building or object worth documenting in the first place. Further to this, focusing only on tangible cultural heritage is no longer enough to impress audiences. When it comes to digital simulations of tangible objects and buildings, consumers of virtual reality experiences and computer or console gaming expect graphics to rival the AAA games they play. These games are produced by large studios for big budgets, something that cultural heritage institutions often can't compete with. We need to find a new hook to intrigue and delight the audience so that they are open to learning more about cultural heritage and architectural history. A building without people has no intrinsic meaning. The lived experience of people in the building is what provides context and culture. This may be in the construction of the building, such as the cyclic recreation of the Ise Shrine in Japan, or the temporary pavilions of World Expos and other types of exhibitions. It might be in the way the building reflects the everyday lived activities within the building that capture life in a period of time, such as a historic Minic cottage from the Gold Rush in Bendigo, Australia. It could be in the changing nature of use over time, the army barracks in Bonagilla making way to a migrant camp and then into a living museum. It could be in the ceremonial or symbolic use of the site, such as a cathedral or stone circle. Because the construct itself can only tell part of the story of its use, intangible heritage can fill that gap. Intangible cultural heritage creates cultural context. It is the everyday activities that bind cultures together and provide traditions that set them aside from other cultures. By drawing on both tangible and intangible cultural heritage, virtual heritage can create an interplay of meaning where cultural activities provide context for the use of the building and the building provides a sense of space and place to ground the culture. Intangible cultural heritage is difficult to replicate in digital 3D models and environments though. It has to be added separately to the model in a way that conveys sometimes nuanced cultural meaning. The audience visiting the virtual simulation often have little to no prior knowledge of the culture of the simulation or the socio-historical context of the period being recreated. They enter as tourists bringing their own expectations and behaviours to an empty building. If the virtual simulation is individual, there is only their own experience of moving through the building to add personal meaning. If the virtual experience is shared, such as in a cave environment, social constructivism can create shared meaning. But it is the meaning of present-day tourists, not that of people who experienced the site at the time. 
Simulating tangible cultural heritage is already a relatively costly task. Adding intangible cultural heritage brings forth other sets of questions, such as what type of intangible cultural heritage will be added? Stories, songs and dances of exalted ceremonies? Everyday chores and tasks? Is there sufficient documentation of these activities? What form does this documentation take? How will they be recreated for the simulation? And what of other humans? To explore how intangible cultural heritage can augment tangible cultural heritage in virtual heritage simulations, we draw on two research projects that recreated ephemeral architecture of the 1930s, the Virtual Pavilion and Triennale Virtuale. The Virtual Pavilion was a simulation of the Italian Pavilion from the 1937 Paris World Exposition. Displayed at Swinburne University of Technology in its Eon iCube, a cave installation, the simulation was projected onto the walls and floor of the iCube and groups of students could navigate the structure, with all students wearing stereoscopic glasses providing a 3D view of the environment and with one student navigating through the virtual environment using an Xbox controller. The project was used in a first-year architectural history unit where students learned about the Italian pavilion through readings and a traditional lecture, then experienced the virtual simulation in small groups from their class. The aim of the Italian pavilion was to project an image of an open, sunny dictatorship in contrast to the aggressive, almost warlike imagery of the two other main totalitarian states, Nazi Germany and Soviet Russia. Made up of a horizontal section parallel to the river and a tall tower recalling the ancient Roman architecture, the pavilion's displays highlighted Italy's achievements within the Paris Expo's overall theme, arts and technology in modern life. Past and present was brought in. The central courtyard featured a modern bronze statue celebrating achievements in aeronautics against a backdrop of Venetian mosaic tiles that featured a Latin quote venerating the classical past. The Triennale Virtuale differed in its method of display from the virtual pavilion. Originally, it was intended for individual virtual experiences. With a VR head-mounted display, the HTC Vive installed at Museo Italiano, the Italian Museum in Carlton, Melbourne. However, the COVID-19 pandemic closed museums in Victoria, Australia during much of 2020, so the installation moved online. This project was shown with instructional videos hosted on YouTube and displayed on the project webpage with online virtual environments hosted on Google Poly, a platform where 3D models and environments could be shared and displayed publicly. The videos and Google Poly environments were accessed by the audience through a web browser. The experience of the Triennale Virtuale environments was individual and involved 360-degree views of the rooms linked together by clicking navigational cues on the screen. The camera would track rotation but not translation, so users could not freely navigate through the scenes as in the virtual pavilion. The Triennale Virtuale differed in its method of display from the virtual pavilion. Originally it was intended for individual virtual experiences. With a VR head mounted display, the HTC Vive installed at the Museo Italiano, the Italian Museum in Carlton, Melbourne. However, the COVID-19 pandemic closed museums in Victoria, Australia during much of 2020, so the installation moved online. This project was shown with instructional videos hosted on YouTube and displayed on the project webpage with online virtual environments hosted on Google Poly, a platform where 3D models and environments could be shared and displayed publicly. The videos in Google Poly environments were accessed by the audience through a web browser. The experience of the Triennale Virtuale environments was individual and involved 360 degree views of the rooms linked together by clicking navigational cues on the screen. The camera would track rotation but not translation, so users could not freely navigate through the scenes as in the virtual pavilion. The Triennale Virtuale project aims to reconstruct the pavilions and exhibition of the Milan Triennale Exhibition of Decorative and Industrial Arts of the 1930s, held in the Palazzo dell'Arte and surrounding Parco Sempione. It showcases two examples of its intangible cultural heritage, an ephemeral pavilion within the park and an exhibition in a building that was destroyed during the Second World War. The first was Saturday House for Newlyweds, which was a full-scale prototype of modern housing built for the housing exhibition at the 1933 Triennale. 
the architecture recalled the naval style of the early 1930s with rounded form and circular windows. However, much of its interest was what it said about the values of the time. Designed to encourage upper-class young couples to procreate on their Saturdays to increase population growth and improve Italian society, the building is testament to fascist views of Italy of the time. The exhibition of mass production was housed in one of the main rectangular spaces of the new pavilion, designed by Pagano as an extension of the Palazzo dell'Arte in 1936. This exhibition showcased industrial products arising from economic reform and investment in industry in Italy. It helped establish industrial design as a discipline and sent the political message that Italy was a great industrial nation. The buildings themselves are examples of intangible cultural heritage meeting tangible cultural heritage. The buildings were designed to be temporary to showcase knowledge and culture of the time. The act of constructing then demolishing exposition buildings demonstrates a particular cultural practice that began in the 19th century. While no intangible cultural heritage was incorporated directly into the virtual environments, audiences were primed with knowledge about cultural context before visiting the cave simulation in small class groups. With the Italian pavilion, students participated in a lecture and reading to understand about the building. With the Triennale Virtuale, users watched educational videos before experiencing the online virtual environment. As separate projects designed for different virtual media experiences, we investigated the virtual pavilion with focus groups of design students and the Triennale Virtuale with members of the public through online questionnaires and individual interviews. The focus of both sets of research was to find out about the experience of learning and being there in the virtual environment. Findings could be categorised in the following ways. Familiar experience versus novel experience. Some users were new to VR and virtual environments and enjoyed the novelty. Those who had prior experience were less impressed. Building on existing knowledge versus learning new information. Some users were delighted to see and learn about architecture they hadn't encountered before. Others enjoyed building on their existing knowledge. Macro attention versus micro attention. Users enjoyed getting an overall feeling of the environment but often found themselves judging its realism. When focusing on individual details they seem to suspend this judgment and react as if they were really there. Understanding the spatial information of details versus holistic experience. Many users reported that it was good to see how space is linked together and get a feeling for the whole. Straightforward experience versus reflective experience. Immediate sensations while using the virtual environment were often positive. Reflective judgments were more critical. Constrained navigation, three degrees of freedom, versus free navigation, six degrees of freedom. Users found free navigation far more compelling than just having 360 degree views from a static place. To analyse the findings for the purpose of improving future virtual heritage projects, we employed motivational goal modelling, a method developed to present the hierarchical structures of the goals of a system. The key difference of motivational goal modelling to other models is the inclusion of emotional goals. In design and psychology, emotion and cognition are intertwined. Affective states influence how people process information and what they decide to do with it. Positive emotional appraisal of a design makes people think it works better. Positive emotions in a design Design are more persuasive. A goal of virtual reality, the feeling of really being there or presence, is primarily emotional, so incorporating emotional goals into the design of the system will potentially benefit the purpose of the design in conveying information to the audience. Motivational goal modelling looks at roles, they are people, real or artificial, functional goals, what do you want to achieve, quality goals, how should it be achieved, and emotional goals, how do you want to feel. These are summarised as do be and feel. These models are useful at early stages of the system design process, used to both capture user needs and share these understandings with stakeholders. We summarised the findings from the two case studies into the following categories. In all instances on the table, the role is audience. Based on analysis of the focus group and interview transcripts, we cast participant feedback as motivational goals in the system. In motivational goal models, the human figure represents the role, the parallelogram is the functional goal, the intended state of the system, the cloud is the quality goal, the non-functional goals that support the functional goals, and the heart is the emotional goal, or how the user wants to feel when this happens. Another point worth noting is that with the do-be-feel motivational goal modelling, feel is the end goal, with do and be 
being the methods used to achieve that emotional state. Focusing on the feelings of the audience and stakeholders allows the research, design and development team to unpack what behavioural elements will work toward this goal and what system elements will support the goal. We documented the present state of the virtual pavilion and Triennale Virtuale audience experiences. In the virtual pavilion, users would first read a book chapter and attend a lecture. They then entered the cave virtual environment in groups. As groups, they explored the environment either through a walkthrough with traditional navigation simulating walking through the environment or as a fly through where they could go through walls or view the sculptures on the roof of the building. As a visual simulation, they could see details in the virtual model. The emotions this supported were that of they felt autonomy, control and agency through six degrees degrees of freedom navigation. They enjoyed the forbidden and special aspects of going through walls and flying up the side of the building. They liked looking at details but were often disappointed by the level of resolution in the environment. In the Triennale Virtuale, users would go to the website and first watch a video explaining the cultural context of the buildings. They would then go to the virtual environment, rotating the 360 degree image to see the scene, then moving to the next room. Again, they reported interest in seeing the details in the rendered scene. Emotionally, they reported liking the video presenter, finding her friendly and enjoying her enthusiasm. People new to virtual environments found novelty in the experience. They liked seeing the whole room and while disappointed with the lack of freedom of navigation, they found a sense of journey by being able to see the entry points and exit points of each room they had entered and left. Again, they reported disappointment sometimes in the level of resolution. However, when they focused on details, they found an increased sense of presence. We then created a motivational goal model to capture what participants said would improve the virtual experience. We propose this as a starting model for the requirements of the next iteration of our virtual heritage projects. Goals supporting the communication of intangible cultural heritage are highlighted in the diagram. Interestingly, the audience did not specifically ask to see people in the spaces acting as if they would have in that historical period, which is probably good given the purpose of the Saturday House for newlyweds. Instead, they wanted a contemporary peer to act as an intermediary, telling the story of the space and how it was used. Most users wanted a tour guide within the space, explaining different aspects of the architecture and objects when they were close to them. They also wanted freedom to explore the space on their own. Students of design had additional requests. They wanted to be able to experience the design and construction of the building. This focused on the tangible cultural heritage, the ability to choose different materials to see if you could match the original photographs of the building. However, this could be used as an opportunity to explain the intangible concepts of how the space was constructed and why it was made that way according to cultural practices of the time. In summary, this research has shown how focus group and interview data can be used to inform a motivational goal model. The motivational goal model provides a way to capture and communicate the audience needs when creating a digital project such as virtual heritage. It helps to understand participant feedback on a system and helps break down and plan requirements for the next developmental iteration. The motivational goal model we created shows ways to incorporate tangible cultural heritage and intangible cultural heritage into a virtual heritage project that responds to the emotional needs of the audience. Intangible cultural heritage contributes context to virtual heritage models of places where human presence gives that place meaning. And from our findings, we propose that it can be effectively achieved through the use of tour guide intermediaries, explaining how the space was built and used and its history historical significance through animations and through relevant task-based interactions. The tour guide would act as a bridge from the current time and culture to past times and cultures. Participants formed an emotional connection with the video tour guide, so this would add to the affective enjoyment of the virtual experience. Different audiences have different expectations for how to learn about the space, and in cases of design students, they wish to be able to experiment with materials to learn by doing in the space. These interactions could be framed in a way to communicate intangible cultural heritage, the traditional ways of building, the cultural reasons for building it that way, how the objects or buildings fit into the broader culture at that time. Animation can also be used to add intangible heritage to the scene.
scene which would assist in the creating of a feeling of presence as the audience is distracted from the whole by animated details and the animation would lend a feeling to the lived inhabited space rather than a static simulation.